part three of our look at biological psychology. In part one, we examine the brain. Part two, we examine the nervous system, which the brain is part of. In this part, we're going to go down to the very small level of an individual nerve cell. So in this particular lecture, we're going to be examining neurons and how these nerve cells communicate and share information that make us able to do all the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. There are lots of different kinds of neurons and uh, experiments and work by psychologists and physiologists, um, neuroscientists are showing different ways that um, neurons function. But we're not going to go into all of that detail here. I'll save that, uh, or you can save that for if you decide to go into med school and neuropsych. Instead, we're going to focus on essentially two kinds of neurons, which no matter the kind of neuron, the job of it is to process, transmit information. Um, so think of it as a, a sort of li little microscopic highway in your body and in your brain. Some of that information sends data from the body, like your legs, to the brain, and we call those sensory neurons. Sensory neurons, um, as the name kind of implies, take in sensory data. So if a mosquito lands on your leg and you feel it, that information goes to the brain. Motor neurons transmit data from the brain to the body. As the name kind of implies, the motor neurons enable your body to move based on what your brain tells it to do. So if you lift your finger to smack uh, or lift your hand to smack that mosquito, that is a motor neuron coming from the brain to the body, information coming via those kinds of neurons. There are other kinds of neurons that we'll talk about later as they come up in specialized um, areas of psychology. Please note that this is a very simplified version of, of what we may need to talk about um, and that there's a great deal more detail out there. Here's a diagram that we have here of a neuron. You can see that it is kind of similar to what you might have learned in biology about cells. There is a cell body, so nothing different essentially than what you learned about in biology. The, the cell body is the headquarters. It has a nucleus um, for the neuron. But you might not have ever heard of the term dendrite before. A dendrite receives signals, and those signals then go into the cell body and then are transmitted onwards. Um, they kind of look like branches, and in fact, that's where dendrite gets its name from. Dendros in Greek is tree. Once the dendrite takes in information, kind of like the on-ramp for an interstate, it gets into the axon. The axon is like the interstate itself, where that information travels down the axon to its destination. Now you can see from this diagram, the axon kind of looks like a bunch of hot dogs glued together. And we're going to talk about why that looks that way, as well as exactly how the axon does its job. The reason that the axon has this sort of like hot dog-like appearance, has to do partially with something called myelin. Axons are covered with a fatty substance, the myelin. This fatty substance is an insulator. The insulator 
helps protect electrical signals from being degraded. Kind of like when you have electrical cord, in the middle there will be the metal, and then around it will be plastic to shield it so that the electricity is not lost. That should tell you that essentially what neurons do is produce electrical signals. And they do that through a chemical means that we'll be talking about in just a minute. You can see also in this diagram that there are these little cells called glia, which help nourish um, the axon um, and protect it. So the myelin has a very significant role. Um, it's not just fat in the brain, random fat in the brain. Um, and you should be aware of the fact that myelinization is a process developmentally that even affects you. I'm considering, for example, that myelin in your brains has to be added in a process, uh, whereas adults uh, would have that already done. You are in the process still of growing. So this is incredibly important for the axon, and it even has a role to play in explaining why you as a teen behave the way you do. More on that when we take a look at the teen brain in a later activity. Um, as I said already, axons transmit electrical impulses. Those are done via chemical means. And you can see that there are these little gaps here. The electricity actually jumps across um, the surface of the axon um, as chemicals flow in and out of the membranes. Um, the name for this is actually saltatory after the Latin word saltare, which means to jump. Let's take a look at what this actually looks like. In the diagram here, you can see we've got the myelin. It's wrapped uh, around the, um, the axon itself. We've got these little gaps, node of Ranvier. Um, we can see the jumping in the arrows here. The jumping is known as an action potential. Uh, whereas negative and positive um, flows of ions across the uh, membrane of the axon create this electrical impulse as it jumps across. These action potentials are what essentially make us do what we do, our thoughts, everything about us is trapped or expressed, I guess maybe is a better word, in this electrical activity. So when we talk about the nerve impulses in the brain, we call them action potentials. Action potentials are interesting because a neuron either fires or it doesn't. There is no 50% firing, 75% firing, or only 20% firing. Either the neuron shoots the electrical impulse or it does not. So this is an all or nothing system. It's like, like binary, ones and zeros. Either it's on or it's off. And people have asked, well, then how do you express the idea that something's really important if the neuron either fires or doesn't fire? Well, it just repeatedly fires. The signal can get sent multiple times. This is important to realize for, um, for neurons because this all or nothing activity done through chemicals means that we can affect the way the brain works, either through electromagnetic impulses that we put in the brain or through drugs that affect the chemicals themselves.
once an action potential reaches the end of the neuron, it comes to what are called axon terminals. Um, they also look kind of like branches, and as you can see from the diagram, they move in different directions. So one neuron can connect to many other different neurons, um, depending on where the message needs to go. In a lot of ways, this is very much like the interstate highway system. Various exits and off ramps and on ramps and connections allow you to go anywhere you want to go, though neurons are actually far more complex. At the very end of the axon terminal is something known as a bulb, a synaptic vesicle. This synaptic vesicle stores chemicals. These chemicals, usually one to two chemicals in, neuron, in each neuron, um, are the actual messages that get sent from one neuron to the next, which should just make you realize how amazing it is that your brain works this way. The synaptic uh, vesicle releases these chemicals across a gap. Neurons don't actually touch um, the next um, dendrite that they are linked to. There is a small, tiny space, a synaptic gap, and the chemical floats across that gap to the dendrite of the next neuron. So the electrical signal jumps, 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 jumps down the axon terminal, gets in the synaptic vesicle, says, release this chemical. The chemical crosses the gap into the next neuron, and that's how messages are sent. The message that tells you to lift your finger, to think about the Pythagorean theorem, to remember your sixth birthday party, all of that occurs via this chemical means. At the synapse, the chemicals, which we're going to call neurotransmitters, um, are specially designed to fit into certain spots on the dendrite across from them. These neurotransmitter chemicals essentially fit kind of like a lock and a key mechanism to send a very specific message. That means if they don't fit, then the message is not sent. Um, this is so that the message will be sent accurately and in the correct way possible. Um, imagine the dysfunction you would have if the on-ramps and the off-ramps didn't actually connect to the interstates they're supposed to, um, but instead they are locked into a specific pattern and that pattern means that um, the message, the travel is efficient. Once the neurotransmitter has done its job, once it's jumped over the gap, locked into place, sent the message, um, it has two options. One option is to be recycled. And they're actually chemicals that hang out in the synapse that break down that neurotransmitter and then recycle its parts to be made into uh, more neurotransmitters. Another possibility for this neurotransmitter is that it could go through reuptake. So it could jump across the synapse and then jump back into the synaptic vesicle and be reused. This is incredibly important because we can affect how the brain works by affecting what happens to the neurotransmitter in the synapse. We can give people drugs that affect whether or not the neurotransmitter gets broken down. We can give people drugs that affect how that neurotransmitter is engaged in reuptake or not reuptake. And so this is a really um, crucial process to understand 
especially when we're trying to treat people for various uh, mental illnesses via chemical means. So this is a very high resolution um, scan of a neurotransmitter. And you can see here all of the little bulbs connecting just hundreds of connections. Think of it as the most complicated interstate highway system you've ever seen in the world. And I know they look like they're actually touching, but believe me, they're not. There is a little tiny gap between these bulbs and um, the dendrite of the next neuron. What are the neurotransmitters? There are actually about 100 of these. We're not going to spend our time learning all 100 of them. Uh, we just don't have time for that. Um, I think it's important for us to understand a few basic ones. And then throughout this class, in fact, we're going to focus on some of them more than others. So let's take a look at the key ones that we're going to interact with. Um, one is called acetylcholine. Another is norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, and GABA, which you don't need to memorize what GABA stands for, just call it GABA. These key ones that we're going to be taking a look at are not just in the brain, but we will see them in the whole body. They have different functions depending on where they're used, depending on the pathways that they go through in the brain. So the story of how this all functions is a really complicated story. Um, if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, one of my neuropsych texts um, that will explain this in a lot of great detail. But for our purposes, let's just talk about them in very simplified kinds of ways. Acetylcholine um, is essential for muscle function, um, essential for memory. Um, so this neurotransmitter, when it breaks down, um, is implicated in diseases where the muscles don't function correctly. Um, or um, certain venoms, for example, um, injected in the body by animals affect acetylcholine. Norepinephrine is um, part of arousal and wakefulness. Uh, so, you know, bringing us to attention and keeping us alert. Epipinephrine is for emergency arousal. So the fight, flight, or freeze aspect uh, that we'd already talked about with the nervous system. Dopamine um, is a neurotransmitter that's important for reward-based learning, pleasure, um, and general learning um, overall. So uh, dopamine is uh, critical um, and is, is very heavily studied um, in terms of addictive behaviors. Um, because of its important role in, you know, rewarding us for something that uh, we value and like. And so we continue to turn to that activity um, in order to get the reward or the pleasure from it. Serotonin is probably um, the single most well-known of the neurotransmitters because of its important role in mood. So when we're talking depression, for example, um, we're talking about serotonin, though actually most of the serotonin in the body is in the gut, uh, where it has to do with motility. Um, sleep, appetite regulation um, are all key aspects of what serotonin does in the body. Glutamate um, increases brain activity, um, so um, it has an important role in um, getting processes going in the brain. And GABA is essentially like a giant stop sign. Um, it stops brain activity. It halts 
whatever neurotransmitter activity is going. Um, these neurotransmitters can be affected by drugs as well. Um, so for example, if I gave you a drug um, that stopped GABA, then brain activity would go. It would just keep on going and keep on going since GABA would be inhibited from preventing you from doing whatever you were doing. This is important to understand because of the role of drugs, um, both legal and illegal substances that we can take that affect our brain chemistry. The drugs that we call agonists mimic a neurotransmitter to increase the effect of that. So an agonist drug um, causes the neurotransmitter um, activity to increase. So for example, if you take an amphetamine, um, it's going to increase um, and make the brain activity go more um, by mimicking that neurotransmitter activity or encouraging more of that neurotransmitter activity. Um, a good example of an agonist in the synapse, um, things like Prozac and cocaine. Cocaine blocks reuptake of dopamine, so dopamine continues to rush um, across um, the synapse, and so that's why people get a high with cocaine. It's also why cocaine is highly addictive, because that rush is really cool, though it doesn't last very long. Um, because you exhaust the supply. Um, sometimes when a, an agonist mimics a particular drug, um, it affects the post-synapse receptor, so it affects it on the other side of the synapse. Um, nicotine, for example, does this, and so it can increase the effect of a neurotransmitter by sending that signal um, where that neurotransmitter would have interacted. So agonist, increase the flow, mimic the activity of the neurotransmitter, um, or interfere with the process of neurotransmission in a way that make your, makes your brain go. Go, 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 go. So agonists, think go for agonists. And notice the word go is in there. Ha ha. Um, antagonists, go to your literature training. What's an antagonist in a story? It's the bad guy. An antagonist is something going against the work of a neurotransmitter. Antagonists decrease the flow or block the flow, or prevent the neurotransmitter from doing um, what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so antagonist drugs can say, no neurotransmitter, you're not gonna cross the synapse. Um, they can actually destroy neurotransmitters in the synapse and gobble them up and eat them. And the result then is that a job that would have been done is now not going to be done. Um, the antagonist has stepped in and said no. So agonists go, antagonists say no. If that helps you remember um, the difference between the two, um, hopefully you can repeat that to yourself on the test. Agonists say go, antagonists say no.